Good morning, everybody. So this is um, joint work with Bart Menning and Jill Vanesh. Uh, so I will not have any nasty questions by Bart, I hope. <laughs> so this is something uh, with the Ketchup team we've been working on for years, I think since 2010 or so. Uh, especially this part, sound hashing modes based on arbitrary functions. And then uh, more recently, a few years ago, um, we started also looking into permutations. And then Bart uh, Manning arrived at Radboud University and we uh, looked into it deeper and we had some nice results. And then we said, why don't we put it in a big sock eh, and submit it to a big sock paper and uh, submit it to FSE. And the result is this. So it's basically about um, how can you, what is that kind of, uh, not the, the least number of conditions a mode has to be has to satisfy, but kind of sufficient conditions for a mode to be sound, to have birthday bound security in the chaining value, uh, and still be simple. And uh, I try to, uh, my ambition is to try to explain you in the coming uh, 20 minutes what this is. Uh, so let's take, start with a number of examples. So we start with uh, SHA-256, uh, but SHA-1 would be the same. So we have, uh, we build a hash function from a, a fixed input length compression function, this one, uh, by applying the merkle darmberg construction. Well known to everyone, I think. If you wouldn't know it, you're maybe not in the right conference. Um, and at this compression function, we build it again in a hierarchical way. So we have two, two layers. We build it again from something smaller, namely a block cipher, because that's something we know how to build. We don't know how to build a fixed input length compression function, but we know how to build a block cipher. And this is basically the Davis-Meyer construction, where we take the block cipher, we put the message block in the key input. This is the key input. The message expansion corresponds with the key schedule. And we encrypt the CV to the next CV, and we put the feed forward. And the underlying uh, primitive in SHA-256 is a block cipher with 256 bit block length and a 512 bit key length, but the key is actually the message input. Another example, uh, so why <coughs> is MD6? So why do I go to MD6? Because this played an important role in the development of this paper. Uh, so it was quite innovative construction, uh, submission to the SHA-3 competition by Rolf Vestadal, a big team that included Rolf Vest. And it's Different from, very different from uh, merkel damgaard in that it's uh, hierarchical. So you basically, the, these points, every one of these points is kind of an application of an underlying compression function. And here are the, the leaves that contain message bits. And then here the chaining values are assembled in uh, intermediate nodes and you build a tree. And this is the final node or the root node as they call it. It is special, it is encoded in a special way, and in every uh, of these intermediate nodes, or also in the leaves, you indicate the coordinates of these in the graph. So they put a lot of uh, uh, encoding on top of this to make sure it's secure. They also had a proof of security of this mode in, uh, if you apply all this code. And this compression function, as we cannot build a compression function, we have to build it from something else. And that was, in their case, a permutation. So it's quite uh, innovative. Huh? And uh, they build it from a permutation with the following construction. They fix part of the input, 15 words. And then they have here a uh, dedicated space for these vectors and also for the key. But OK, that's not important here. And the data. And then they do the permutation and they chop. So they truncate the output. And this is then the chaining value. And this is then. Uh, Again, so you, you, you apply that here. The chaining value goes then here, and it will be put in this place. So it's a dedicated construction. And the uh, underlying primitive, this permutation, was a 5,696-bit permutation. Talking about big permutations. Huh? Uh, also, this prepend is 15 words. It's 15 times 64. So that's, I cannot compute out of my head what that would be, but that's a lot of bits that you lose. So this could be, our idea was, this can be done better. Eh? So we can do this much more cheap. OK, then a more recent example, Kangaroo 12, is something we proposed uh, in 2016 and presented on uh, ACNS, right, uh, in uh, Leuven recently. And what it does is that the goal of this Kangaroo 12 is that it's parallel, parallelizable. And we do it with an hierarchical mode, where basically we have one layer only. Um, each of these blue blocks is part of the message, so we split the message in a number of chunks, and each of these chunks we can hash uh, independently, and then we 
add some padding bits coming from Sakura, our uh, coding mode. And um, so each of these arrows is the underlying uh, uh, compression function, which is in this case a ZOF. And we get also a ZOF because this, this thing is a ZOF by itself, so the output is a variable length, yeah, extendable length. So what do we use for this underlying ZOF? We use the well-known sponge. And what is sponge by itself? It builds uh, a ZOF from a permutation, and the permutation is Ketchak P12. So Ketchak P with, uh, with 1600 bit, 12 rounds. So these are three different examples of what hash functions look like. So you see typically a number of layers of constructions, and in the end you reduce to something you can build, which is either a, a permutation or a block cipher. Okay, so what's the basis of security for hash functions? Well, we're in a provable security session, but we should not uh, forget that we cannot prove a hash function secure. We cannot prove a block cipher secure or a permutation or anything. We can only rely on public scrutiny and crypto analysis, right? That's what we have to rely on. But we can do something close to provable, proving the security. It namely, we can idealize this hash function by replacing the underlying primitive by something completely random like a random permutation or something randomly drawn from the space of all uh, primitives. And um, that we can prove. And what we mean by proving secure is that we can show that it's hard to distinguish from a random oracle, where a random oracle is the ideal hash function. Now that's the, <coughs> our great ideal. And that proves that actually any attack that breaks this hash function must exploit properties of the underlying primitive. So uh, it says something about the mode. Yeah. And that's what this talk is about, about this mode. So you can say, yeah, OK, but in the end, if you replace this idealized uh, underlying primitive by a concrete uh, instance, then the proof is no longer valid. Yes, but it's still good to have this proof, because what can happen if you don't have a good bound? Huh? So remember this construction. Well, it suffers from length extension. And I'm not going to explain it, but what is a consequence of length ex extension is that if you use this for as a MAC function, where you just put here the key and here the rest of the message, so, uh, the message, and so you just compute a MAC on a message where you prepend the key and the input, that's not secure against forgery. And there is a fix, that's HMAC, but it's quite expensive, actually. Uh, other things are that many attacks <laughs> were found that had a complexity lower than expected. So for instance, for long messages, second pre-image is not n, where n is a digest length. It's not uh, security strength n, so it does not take 2 to the power n, but 2 to the power n divided by the length of the message. Uh, Multi-collision attacks much faster than for a random order, and so on. And all this, this affects all these old-style hash standards, like MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-2. OK, so now what are the modes we will treat in this paper? Um, actually, we look at modes that you can uh, describe in a two-phase process. So you don't have to compute it in a two-phase process, but you can uh, visualize or you can conceptualize it like that. So what do I mean by that? So in the first phase, we look only at the length of the message. Yeah? We do a process that only depends on the length of the message to be hashed. And maybe some parameters. So for instance, in MD6, there was a parameter saying serial or parallel. And that would give two different modes. So you can have here also parameters saying what the length of these blocks are, or maybe, um, yeah, that's hard to say. Uh, here, for instance, we have two chaining values per intermediate. You can have three or four, so a number of parameters. And using these parameters and the length of the message, we build a kind of recipe to do the hashing of this mess of any message of this length. Yeah? So in this case, we have a message of 21 bits. And the template says that we have to take the first six bits, we have to put them here, the next six bits here, the next six bits here, and the remaining few bits here. That we have to add padding. And then that we have to append two zeros to each of these blocks that then we have to apply our compression function, our underlying function, to each of these and assemble here the chaining values, append one zero, and so on. So this is kind of a recipe. And you see um, three different colors, these light gray that are message bits, the dark gray are chaining value bits, and the white bits, uh, the white are the, the frame bits, so bits that are, do not depend on the message content nor of the output of the intermediate function. Okay, so what we 
we only allow the input to the function always to be a concatenation of these three types of bits. We don't, this model does not cover, for instance, a feed forward. Yeah, we cannot do a feed forward in this model, but we don't need it. So at least we think we don't need it. So this is the first phase where you come, where you, this is really where the mode comes in. T, t stands for the mode. Why is it T? Because we, we were initially thinking only of three hash modes, but now it's also sequential. Um, so this is where the mode comes in. The mode comes in where you convert your length of your message and parameters into this template that we call a template. Then the second phase is where we basically take the template, take a message, and just execute it, and a function f. So here, this is completely independent of the underlying uh, function, underlying uh, primitive. Here, this function comes in, see? The uh, message comes in, so the content of the message, not just the length, and uh, this, this template. And we execute it. Basically, we just do what the template says us to do. Right? So we put these bits, put them there, then apply f, and so on and so on. And the hash is basically our underlying function applied to this node. We call that the final node of the tree. So this we call a hash tree, or short tree, and this is a tree template. So, and it's actually the properties of these trees that make a mode uh, secure. If RT is such that it only generates trees that satisfy certain conditions, then our mode is secure. So we, this also covers sequential hashing, because sequential is just a special form of tree. And we did it for the three types of underlying functions. For, well, this is an arbitrary function with no special properties, so like a ZOF or uh, a, hash, a hash function or a fixed input length compression function. It can be a truncated permutation, and it can be a block cipher or even a truncated block cipher. So where we take as chaining value part of the data output, the cipher text, let's say, truncated to some data. Okay, so now I'm going to try to explain the conditions in my 10 minutes that I have left. So these are the conditions. So I'm not going to now name them. I'm going to immediately try to explain them. So here, this is the space of all possible binary trees you can imagine. Well, trees consisting of binary strings. So it's kind of these trees, they have a connectivity. In the paper, it's well uh, defined. And it's an infinite space, but I yeah, just depict it like a rectangle. And in this space, a node, uh, a mode T, it defines a set of trees you could possibly arrive at. Yeah? And that's what we call uh, the, the, the set of trees generated by the mode T. I could call, call this ST, but yeah, it would be a bit, yeah, I worked for ST. Um, okay, so now let's take a look at our first condition called message decodability. It says that if we have a tree then uh, that is uh, generated with the mode, huh? So by applying our mode to a concrete message with a concrete function, then from this tree, we should be able to unambiguously uh, derive the message and the template. Yeah? So we can actually, from this, reconstruct the message and the template. That's condition one. Condition two is, here's a more abstract depiction of uh, such a tree where we don't put the bit strings. And um, I'm going to use it to define some, some ideas. So we can define in this tree, this is a tree of ST, yeah? we can define different types of subtrees. So this is a final subtree. Final subtree is a subtree that contains the final node. Yeah? This is a leaf subtree. A leaf subtree is a subtree where from its root all the descendants are in. So you don't, you have all, you have up to the leaves. And this is just a subtree. It's not a, not, not a final, not a leaf subtree. So we, again, to our big diagram. Now we can define the set of all trees that are proper subtrees of trees in here. Yeah? So we take all the trees in here, and then we take for each of these trees, we remove some nodes, and then we can form the set of all proper subtrees. And we call that ST sub. And sub t Freenis says that this set and this set must have empty intersection. That's the condition. That's all. So you cannot have a tree that is at the same time a tree of ST and a subtree of a tree in ST. Okay, third condition, radical decodability. So you see here, it feels very bad because there must be something missing here, right? Yes. So there is here a chaining value where there is no arrow going to. 
And we call <laughs> such a chaining value, we call that a radical. Yeah. So it is kind of something missing. Um, so now I try to define radical decodability. So I have here I die a diagram with the subtrees and the trees. Um, and a subset of the subtrees are the leaf trees, non overlapping with the final trees. If they would overlap, that would be then a full tree, so that cannot happen. And radical decodability simply says that um, of these trees, you can always find a radical. Right? Because this tree is not complete, you can always you unambiguously define a, uh, find a radical. The real radical decodability is a bit more uh, subtle. Um, and you would think this is more restrictive, but this is actually less restrictive. So we allow, um, we have a slightly larger set, or can be much larger set than ST final, that where you can identify a radical. So this is radical decoding. So now let's take a look at what we mean by sound. We look in the indifferentiability model that was introduced by Maurer in um, 2005, Maurer et al. and the team. And later applied to hashing by Gaon et al. And um, we applied it already for sponge. And there we proved an advantage uh, to choose of n, so a combination 2 of n to the power minus c, which is basically the birthday bound in the capacity. Yeah, so as soon as you got internal collisions in the capacity, you, you lose it. Um, and here in our paper, we, for this setup, we can prove it uh, where we replace the C by the length of the chaining value. So as soon as you have uh, collisions in the chaining value, you lose it. So, but I have to explain a bit this diagram. So I have here the adversary, and the adversary can query our construction. No, he cannot query our construction. He is, can actually query with messages and templates. So the mode is here. He's doing the mode. And he builds messages, and that is to, uh, to take into account these parameters. So I'm not going to explain it here, because then I would go over time. Um, but uh, so the adversary has access to the execution of the template. And he has access to the underlying uh, compression function, the underlying primitive. And he can actually check consistency of the responses here and here, because this is a very simple parser. He can do that himself. So he can do either send mz or build z itself and do the thing. And that must be consistent. And this will, will be consistent. But at the other <coughs> side, you have the random oracle, who has to actually, our mode should behave like a random oracle. So the random oracle is like, there's no choice here. And we also query the random oracle with m and the templates. And for any any uh, MZ that will give a different answer unless they are the same. And you can also query here uh, the simulator that we have an in indifferentiability, uh, and this must be consistent. And these conditions basically allow the simulator to do his work. That's it. Because of these conditions, the simulator knows what's going on, and he can be consistent with the random mark. That's the whole point. So we get this bound if the mode satisfies our conditions. So but there's one condition I didn't mention, because uh, that's the, the additional condition for block ciphers and permutations, truncated permutations. And then we can do inverse queries, which we cannot do in a compression function, a ZOF, or a hash function. And um, without this additional condition, uh, you cannot build a good uh, simulator, because you cannot, the simulator cannot know what's going on as soon as people start doing inverse queries. And then we need an additional condition, which is leaf anchoring. And leaf anchoring, means that the n first bits of the permutation are reserved. Either they are a constant IV in leaf nodes, or they are a, they are a CV in non-leaf nodes. For block <laughs> ciphers, this also applies, but this anchoring must be in the data input, so not in the key input. You can take other countermeasures, but this is the simplest. Uh, one countermeasure that doesn't work is a Davis-Meyer feed forward. That doesn't work. It doesn't work against this. OK, so then let's look, take a look at the minimum solutions. So with a compression function, actually, uh, you can satisfy these conditions by just this simple mode, where you have to add two frame bits per call, and here's some padding. That's all you need to do. This is a fixed input length compression function. So there's no need for an IV, mm -hmm. and here you just have a, every time the CV as first block. If you work with a truncated permutation or a block cipher, like, for instance, SHA-256, you, you have to put an IV. Yeah? 
And then you can have actually get rid of one of these two bits, and you only need one frame bit, yeah? and you can put that directly after the IV. So for instance, in SHA-256, you could put here 255-bit IV and 255-bit CV and one bit. And you would have here the 512-bit completely at your disposal, no length padding or anything. This would be more secure from this point of view than the current SHA-256. Uh, SHA okay. So what are the implications of this work? So, um, well, you can do a tree hashing mode on top of a secure ZOF, and that will give you a secure ZOF. And so if this ZOF is secure, the tree hashing mode will also be secure. So that's Kangaroo 12 as an example. And the Sakura encoding actually ensures two of these conditions. For hashing based on permutations, Sponge is not covered. So that's something else. So we didn't cover Sponge, but Sponge was covered in 2008, so that's sufficient. MD6, if you look at all this, this uh, magic that they put in all this coding, they, they could have actually just put n bit IVs in leaves and one frame bit, and it would be much more efficient, and they wouldn't need a 5,000 bit permutation. Um, for hashing based on block ciphers, from this analysis, in this context, Davis Meyer feed forward is useless. Merkel Damga strengthening, this length coding, is useless. And the CV can actually be shorter than the block length of the cipher. So if you take SHA-512, for instance, you can take, uh, uh, if you just aim for 128 bits of security, and why would you aim higher? You can just reduce the chaining value to 256 bits. Okay, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Questions for Johan? So... I have one. Do you know if the conditions you define <coughs> ensure that the mode is collision resistance preserving? Because it's not implied by indifferentiability. It could be that the, that the compression function is collision resistant, but the, the mode is not, yeah, even that, if you prove indifferentiality. Yeah, that's meaningful if you, can buy, uh, if you can build something that is collision resistant. So we, uh, as symmetric crypto guys, cannot build something that is collision resistant. We build something that looks as random as possible. Also. So it's collision resistance preserving is fine, but at some point you have to you have to rely on randomness. Like ideal cipher model, huh? you can say yeah, that, uh, maybe uh, um, uh, the ideal cipher with the uh, feed forward is maybe collision resistant. I don't know. Is that can that be proven? If it's an ideal cipher, but you're not relying on the, on the collision resistance. You're relying again on this. So. Yeah, but but it's it's a, it's a property of the mod that you could prove, yeah, 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 and which so, is not implied by so. No, so but it's, I'm not so sure. It but nice I think uh, we have collision resistance. But I thought we had. But it's not the essence. Uh, we look at indifferentiability basically. No, that's implied by indifferentiability. Uh, no, it's not. There is a paper by uh, Bellare and Winston Pat, which, which gives examples where you have indifferentiability, but the mod is not yeah, but collision this is a resistance. Very strong indifferentiability. And this indifferentiability is uh, super tight. So I don't know if you can get this tight indifferentiability and still have uh, collision, uh, not have a collision resistance preserving. But uh, yeah, we didn't even mention it in our paper because we think it's not important. Other questions? Well, if not, let us thank Johan and all the speakers of the session. Thanks for attending, and it's time for a coffee break.